Well, I don't think we can be confident we know the full picture, and that's the trouble. That's why this week in Parliament, we want to force a vote to get the government to release the full list of all of the schools affected. And also to be clear about the timescale around this and why we haven't seen action sooner. I think a lot of parents will be concerned about what we're seeing, but even where mitigations are put in place, we know it's going to be incredibly disruptive. If children are going to have to move to alternative accommodation or to porter cabins or, or are stuck in classrooms with steel props holding up the ceiling. I mean, I don't think there can be a more defining metaphor for the last 13 years of Conservative government than children sat in classrooms with steel props to stop the ceiling falling in on their heads. But dealing with the specifics of this week, tomorrow morning, parents are going to have to make mm. decisions. If a parent felt that their child is not safe because they just don't know and said, I'm not sending my child to school, would you support them in keeping their child away from school? I think children have missed out on so much education already. There's been so much disruption, both from the pandemic and also more recently with the industrial action that government ministers took months and months to resolve, took far too long. I know that school leaders across the country will be doing everything they possibly can to make sure that children are safe. But I am concerned that we hear reports of engineers, structural engineers, being sent into schools to do a further assessment of what's going on. I think that's why ministers need to come clean, be upfront and be honest with parents about what we're facing right now. Yeah, but at 7.30 tomorrow morning, you're a parent yourself, you may have to make a decision because you don't have the information, your head teacher doesn't have the information. If a parent said, my child is not going to school until I am absolutely sure, would you support them in taking that decision? I want children back in school, both as a parent and um, as the Shadow Secretary of State. I think it's really important they are there. But the way that we can assuage parents' concerns, the way so, that we can, so we can give that reassurance, is for ministers to make a statement on Monday to the Commons, to give us the full list and all the detail. But, but, we, but the, the problem is that but, but, this is... We're talking specifically about this, this form of crumbly concrete rack. I mean, there are wider issues across the school estate, and this has been allowed to develop. I get that, but for years. parents watching now, they're thinking about what happens in the next 24 hours, and what I take from what you said is that you would essentially not recommend parents take decisions into their own hands. They basically take whatever the school tells them, and if the school says, actually, it's fine, uh, then send your child to school. I know school leaders will be doing what's right by the children in their school and in their care, and children need to be in school, absolutely. What would you be doing this, uh, this morning that you think the government is not doing? Well, I think we need to be upfront, have that full list, and be absolutely clear about what's going on. And if we need further surveys to take place in order to determine the full scale of what's happened, then so be it. But I think we do have to look back to the decision that was taken in 2010 by the incoming Conservative government. Labour had a plan uh, to rebuild or to refurbish every single secondary school in our country. That would have happened by 2020. One of the first actions of that incoming Conservative government, and actually the same minister, Nick Gibb, who's now having to defend the government's record, was to cancel Labour school rebuilding programme. So after 13 years of total failure from the government, the chickens have come home to roost. Well, we'll talk to the government about that uh, that issue. Uh, or oh, we've talked to government about, about that. But uh, let's remember, this uh, concrete w was uh, used from the 1980s and 1990s. And then risks were noted back then before 13 years of uh, Labour government. Well, why did your predecessors as uh, Labour Education Secretaries do nothing about it? Well, Labour had a major school rebuilding programme, the Building Schools for the Future programme. We recognised that many schools, even setting aside this issue of crumbly concrete, many schools were due to reach the end of the lifespan, the, the time that they were designed to be built for. That's why we rebuilt and refurbished schools the length and breadth of England. And but then to have the first with... action of the cons incoming Conservative government was to stop that and never to put in place a proper plan to rebuild schools. But you left schools with rack in place. Well, the risks have become more apparent as time has drawn on, but as I say, every single secondary school in England would have been rebuilt or significantly refurbished by 2020 had the Conservatives not scrapped Labour's plans. I think it's complete negligence on their part to scrap a perfectly good plan to not put in place a replacement. And it was but, Rishi Sunak as Chancellor who halved the school's refurbishment my, my, budget, even in the last couple of my, years, my they've point, been cutting it further. My point is, you can blame them, but surely you might want to accept a little bit of the responsibility here. If you want the Conservatives to apologise for uh, Michael Gove and Nick Gibbs uh, 
mistake, let's say, ten years ago, uh, would you encourage them by apologising for Labour not doing anything about it when it was in government? I make no apology for the actions of the last Labour government in absolutely transforming schools the length and breadth of our country. I went to school in one of those buildings in the 90s where the building had been condemned, there were props all over. It was hugely disruptive to education. This is not just an inconvenience, this impacts children's ability to learn. And I don't believe that children can get a first-class education in second-class buildings. That's why Labour transformed the schools estate but after 13 years if we win the next election we will inherit crumbling schools a teaching workforce that is on its knees and rising levels of child poverty and real pressures that families are facing so as in 97 it will Look, fall to the next Labour government if we're fortunate to win that election to do all of that once more. I want to come to what you might or might not do if you form a government but just before we do that can I just ask you about your plans for um the cost of school uniforms. Every parent's going to be thinking about that right now. Absolutely. And, you know, the return to school is an exciting time, but it's a big cost pressure for lots of families too. And, and the rising costs that we've seen and the fact that lots of schools are insisting on a range of branded items really drives up the costs to parents and to families. And that's why I'm saying that we would strengthen the guidance and we would insist that schools cannot ha insist on so many branded items, blazers and, and the like, we would allow them to do that, a maximum of up to three for uniform and PE kits. That would save families potentially hundreds of pounds every year in reducing that cost. Making sure that children do look smart, that we respect schools' ability to determine uniform policy, but in the middle of cost of living crisis, we've got to cut costs to families too. All this is going to cost, uh, cost you money. Um, your colleague, uh, Rachel Reeves, has been pretty iron-willed on saying you're not going to spend any money that you, you haven't got. Um, what, what are you going to do if you turn up in government and you find there isn't the money to do all of these things? Rachel Reeves is absolutely right to insist that the cornerstone of any Labour government has to be around financial uh, security and about making sure the economy is in a stable position. We saw what happened last year when the government crashed the economy, were reckless and cavalier in their approach. Oh. And the consequences that people are facing right now is a direct consequence, more on their mortgages, rising bills. These have real-world <laughs> consequences. So, yes, absolutely, an incoming Labour government would face significant challenges about the pace and the scale of what we could do. But we have to grow the economy, and that has to be on the basis of a firm foundation. I, I, I want to ask you about the nature of an incoming Labour government. We may be no more than 12 months away from a general election. And I think many people would say, we still don't quite know what Labour stands for. But there are some people who think they do. I want to show you something. This morning, um, a Republican senator from Iowa, Chuck Grassley, who is the fourth most senior politician in the United States, President Pro Tempo, uh, praised Rachel Reeves', uh, Reeves economic stance. He called it Reagan-esque. Are you proud of that? Oh, I don't accept that uh, characterisation. I think what you... This man's been in politics for half a century. He knows what he's on about. <laughs> well, he's entitled to his view, but I don't agree with that characterisation. I think what you will see uh, with Rachel Reeves, uh, if she is the next Chancellor of our country, is a real focus on doing what's right by Britain's family. So making sure we're growing our economy, easing the cost of living pressures that families are facing, but also looking to the long term, how we build a more resilient economy, how we make Britain proud to be central on the world stage I, once more. I, I get all of that, but what we hear from Rachel Reeves and Keir Starmer is we will follow the plans, uh, we will be stuck with the Tory spending plans, we will, do, we will not do anything that betrays indiscipline and so on. You've got a year to define Labour. Are you hoping to win by saying, we're going to do the same as the Tories, only we'll do it more nicely? No, and, you know... Well, we... what's, what's going to be different? So, the missions that Keir has been setting out, one of them that I've been leading around opportunity, is how we make sure that no matter what your background, you have every chance to get on in life. I think that's a very ambitious you're vision. Me about the ambition, particularly when you consider what's been happening under the Conservatives. You're telling me about the ambition, but you're not telling me how you would actually be different from Tories. So... I'll give you some examples. Private schools, we would end their tax breaks. We would put that money into delivering a brilliant state education for every child. We would end the non-DOM tax okay, status. So we would deliver the biggest expansion okay, so it's good of an NHS Labour workforce, attacking breakfast rich. clubs and primary schools. No, absolutely not. This is about fairness in the tax system. And the government are very fond of telling us okay. that there are tough choices. I think those choices are pretty straightforward. And maybe Jeremy Hunt could tell us when he's going to act against private schools and put that money into state schools. David Blunkett said this morning um, in one of the national newspapers, it will take a minor miracle for Labour to win a majority. Do you agree? 
It, the scale of what we faced in 2019, the defeat we suffered, means that we have an awful lot to do. We're fighting hard for every vote, we take nothing for granted. But I know how, uh, how a Labour government could transform our country once more, and that's what we're focused on in that year running up to the next election. Bridget, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.